This workshop is part of R4 Repair, an ongoing exhibition by Hans Tang Studio at the National Design Center, which presents a counterpoint in the modern consumerist culture where repair is either deprecated or ironically deemed extravagant. Through the exhibition and also today's workshop, we hope to shift the concept of repair away from mere restoration and to get you to reimagine the role of repair as an inspir inspiring activity that produces aspiring outcomes. And with that, I'll hand the time to Ng Luo Wei and Mervin Chen, who will be our instructor instructors for today. So Luo Wei and Mervin, over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Mervin and this is Luo Wei. So thank you for coming here today for this workshop. So uh, before we start, maybe we just talk, uh, talk about the project a little bit. So uh, our project is called Canvas and it's a, it's a shoe repair kit that we have created. And it makes use of uh, liquid rubber paint to repair shoe holes that uh, people get through like wear and tear. So uh, with that, we will start to proceed with the repair of the shoes. So uh, Lori we will begin to move into position to demonstrate the repair. And I hope that you all enjoy the workshop. Okay, so just to check that uh, everyone has their uh, shoes with them or like their object of repair, which is a shoe. So uh, it'll be, it'll also be great if uh, you all can on your camera, so we can also guide you along and see how your repair process of the shoe is, and if there's anything that we can look out for as well. Yeah, so if uh, we can also start to prepare a repair area for you. So for us, we have a we have a cutting mat to prevent our table to keep our table like clean. So for you, maybe you can like have some newspaper or anything to lay on the table so to pretend uh, to prevent any like pain from touching your tables. Yep. For now, we will continue. So uh, as you can see on the screen right now, uh, Lowe is holding up the canvas repair kit. So this is what you should be having with you as well. And uh, so this is the kit. And so we'll go through what, what, what is included in the kit right now. So, um, yeah. so firstly, we have the two paint bottles. Uh, that comes in red and white. So later on, you can choose like whatever colors you want to use for your repair. And next in the kit, we have a stack of stencils, which will guide you later on in creating shapes and designs on your shoe. And lastly, is a wax paper that uh, later on will tell you how to use so that it allows for the repair to be done uh, more properly, yeah. So uh, we can go through the stencils as well. So for the stencils, we have um, a variety of shapes for you to choose. So as you can see right now, uh, Lori is holding up the circular stencil. Yeah. So this is one stencil and included we have others as well, which, come, which comes in uh, more rectangular shapes and of different sizes as well, yeah. Yeah, and we have like a uh, different size rectangles. Okay. Okay, so uh, we can start off with the shoe repair. So right now, uh, for us, we have a pair of shoe here with with a hole on the side. And so I don't know how, depending on your own shoe, there might be small holes or varying sizes of hole, but not to worry, like the kit should be able to uh, repair as long as they're not too big. <laughs> yeah, so uh, now uh, this is our example of uh, our hole. And what's, uh, some of us, we have black color paint. Uh, we do, but <clears throat> for today, we have only given out um, these two colors. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, so right now, uh, we'll go through the repair process and you can also repair along with us and, and if there's any questions along the way, you can raise up your hands as well. <coughs> okay, so um, for our repair area, the, uh, the first thing you want to do is to trim and um, get the area as clean as possible so that the paint sticks onto the surface without um, any excess like debris. But if yours is just a tiny hole with not much uh, fraying of fabric, then it's fine. Yep. So, uh, so we will now cut and trim the surface. Yep. So this is just to remove like any frayed ends that, that exist on the hole so that the repair will be uh, cleaner. But if, if you do not need to do this step, you can just uh, hold on for now. Yep. So it's just trimming a little bit. And okay, then the next step is to prepare the shoe for the the repair. So, uh, does the shoe have to be washed? So, uh, is I think it's up to you. But then, um, like the the paint should be able to hold as long as it's not being like hand washed too vigorously so uh yeah but it depends on uh, your own preference or your state of the shoe as well <laughs> yeah okay so now uh what we'll begin to do is to stuff the shoe so that later on that when we repair is the shoe there'll be a much more firm surface for the paint to sit on so if you all have any like newspaper around you or any anything just to stuff the shoe for this repair, uh, it'll be great. So as you can see, uh, well, we will now begin to stuff the shoe. So this uh, where the wax paper will come in if your if your shoe hole is very big. So what you can do is take the wax paper and put it onto your, your ball of stuffing that you want to place in the shoe. So this will create a surface for the pin uh, to rest on if, if your shoe repair is really big. Yeah, but if your hole is not that big, then it's still fine. So we will create something like this, where the wax paper is above, and and now we will stuff it into the shoe, in a way where the the surface of the wax paper will will be below, beneath the hole or your area of repair. Okay. Yeah. So. Now your shoe should have a surface where it's, it's more sturdy. Okay. Then so for the next portion, um, you'll be repairing the shoe itself. So right now we, we are we will use the stencils to create design. So it's up to you to create whatever designs you want. But for now, uh, we'll be using one of the stencils. So the, the way the sensors work is that you use the, the outline of it so you can see how uh, Lowe is taking off the sensor now. Yeah. So it's supposed to surround the area of repair that you're, you're doing on your shoe. Yeah. So for us it's here and we will just put a, a sensor around it. So you can choose um, whatever designs you want we, uh, based on the sensor we, we have given and whatever shapes that you feel you prefer. Yeah. So uh, one thing you know is that if your shoe has um, some corners like, like ours right now, it would be good to press them down and uh, so that the sensor really fits onto the surface properly. Yeah. yeah, so you should stick, try to stick the sensors as neatly as you can onto the shoe so that uh, the the paint will form a, a much more cleaner like circle or whatever shape that you chose. Yeah. So we'll give you all like some time now and maybe when you are done with sticking your sensors, uh, you can use the race time feature in the, in the zoom.
Yeah, so this is a time where you all can just uh, uh, just be creative and think of how you want to place the design on your shoe. So the area that will have the pain is the the area that is surrounded within the sensor. Okay, uh, so Sopan asks, how long does a pin take to set? So, uh, uh, it, oh, <laughs> you're wearing the shoe now. <laughs> okay, uh, I think it takes about like, the, like for it to fully dry completely, it takes a like, it, it'll be safe to have like at least like around like three hours, but like for the surface to dry, maybe like, 30 minutes. Yeah, but I ideally I I, <laughs> I don't know if you can wear it on this on right now. Yeah. But I don't I don't think the pain will move a lot. But if, if you're walking around a lot with it, then it might it might shift during the drying process. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, just to check if uh, everyone is ready or if, if not, we will move on soon. Yeah. Okay, yep. so uh, we'll carry on from now. And so after you have the sensor placed, so um, now we'll demonstrate to you how we'll repair with the pin. Uh, so for this part, we uh, suggest that everyone watch first how we do it because um, the pin like, is uh you should try not to touch it as much as possible. So maybe you can you can see you can see how we do it first. Then after on you can do it yourselves when we give you the time. Yeah. Okay. So now uh go away. We'll repair the shoe with the pin. So first, as you can see, our bottle tip um is it's a flat tip bottle that uh, we have designed so that uh you can cover more area as you repair. Yeah. So uh how Laurie is going to do this is uh she'll so you have to do this in uh, one motion in, so try not to go over and dab, dab areas that you dab the pain over and over again. So you should do it in one shot, almost like um, covering a surface. So you can see how Lori goes from left to right and uh, top to bottom as she paints. Yeah, so now uh, she can do it. Yeah. And don't be afraid to have a substantial amount of pain on it. So you should, you should put, you should have it uh, around like, um, one to two mm thickness from the surface. Yeah. So you do not actually need to uh, press onto the surface or or like your like your painting, but rather uh, give it a good amount of paint. Like do not be scared because later on the paint will dry down as well. Yeah. So it'll it look a bit more than it should, but it's it, it's correct. Yeah. So how Laurie is doing it is that she'll go through um the surface layer by layer so that she don't need to go back and touch like the previous areas that she have covered. Yeah. But if you really want, if you really need to uh, touch up a bit, you can squeeze on more paint, but try not to touch around because the surface of the paint um, dries pretty quickly and is you'll get a cleaner surface if you don't touch it as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is a part where uh, you shouldn't leave it uh, too long. So. Once you are done with the paint, you can peel off the sensor. So how long is doing it is um, from the bottom up. Yeah. So you want to, uh, you, you don't need to rush that quickly, but you want to do it as, as fast as possible, um, the painting and the removing of stencil so that um, the paint doesn't dry onto your sensor before you can remove it. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, Lori now has removed the sensor and uh, we have this uh, circular shape of paint on the shoe. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you all can see, but the pin is the thickness of the pin is um is quite substantial. Yeah. So as Lori like turns around the shoe, maybe you can see it, actually how thick it is that we have applied. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So this is how um you do the repair, and I mean, as you leave it to see, it'll just dry down and and form the surface. Okay, yeah, so uh, you all can go ahead and do it right now. Um, and if anyone has any questions, you can 
ask us as well. Yeah. But the idea is you try to do it um one shot as much as possible and don't don't spend too much time um thinking. Yeah. And to peel off the stencil as uh as fast as you can as well. Uh okay, so as to us we will this do on later. Uh we have tried on one like ladder shoe before. Um, but it will definitely um, work better on canvas because it's um, a bit more porous kind of uh, material. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, the repaired shoe we have now. So we, it's ideal to leave it on um, a flat surface, like the, the paint to be on a flat surface as it dries so, so that uh, there will be less movement of the paint as it dries. Yeah. Uh, so as to ask, will masking tape work as a stencil material? Uh, yeah, actually, as long as the, the tape sticks uh, well onto the surface, it will work. Yeah, but it's just that uh, we have designed these stencils in in this shape so that if people want to do like uh, circular designs and all that, you can do as well. Yeah, but actually, any tape that sticks onto the surface will work. Uh, Okay. But anyway, um, um, when you are using the uh, masking tape as a uh, material, it you also have to like take note on like the area that you cover. So if it's if it's too huge of area, then you might not be able to do it fast enough where the sensor like the the paint won't dry out on the sensor. So it's just to take note. Yeah. But yeah, but you are open to do like any designs you want. Okay. So uh, let's check. Some are done. Uh, okay, so Catherine asked, will the paint smudge if we combine two colors? Uh, I I think it should it should be able to just that um don't because the paint dries up um quite fast, so you have to do it when it's still like uh wet. Yeah. Oh. See in this exam. Yeah. So uh. It often has tried the uh, two color. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh just to close off or yeah, if anyone has any more questions you can or like final questions you can ask. But also uh we we would like to take a photo with everyone and their repaired product. So it'll it'll be great if you all can on your cameras and uh yeah we can just take a photo of the what you have repaired together as a workshop. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll give everyone like 10 more seconds if you all are still owning your camera. <laughs> yeah, if not, we'll take the photo soon. Yeah, no problem, Jim. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we take the screenshot now. Uh, three, two, one. Okay. okay. Catherine asks, can you paint over the spot? Uh, you mean like multiple layers or like? Okay. Like it's fully dry. Uh, you can do that, but uh, you should ideally do it when the the bottom layer has fully dried up, so that because when you paste the stencil. Yeah, because if you need to paste stencils or anything, then uh, you need a dry surface. Yeah. Okay, so if that's it, I think we'll end the workshop here. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us for this workshop. And uh, for now, I hand, hand the time over back to uh, Cheryl. So thank you so much, Lo and Mervin. And before we go, um, we really appreciate it if you could complete a simple survey for this workshop to help us improve on our future programs. You can do so by scanning the QR code you see on the left.
And if you'd like to find out more about the programs that the National Design Center has lined up under the theme of sustainability and design, do scan the QR code that you see on the right. And with that, we end the session for today. Thank you once again, Loe and Mervin, and to all of you for spending your morning with us. And if you have not if you have not already done so, do head down to National Design Center to check out the R4 Repair Exhibition before it ends on 6th February. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shana and uh, I'm from Wayne. Yeah, so uh, our repair kit now is a missing puzzle piece repair kit. Yeah, so Feng Lin will now go over to prepare and like just a quick introduction of our repair kit. Um, to us, we saw repair as like the opposite of replacement and instead it can be used to embrace the object's flaws as well as opening up opportunities for different definitions of beauty and perfection. Uh, and this like inspired us to come up with um, this specific method of repair. So before we begin, we just want to check that you guys have all the tools, all the relevant tools. So. Firstly, um, maybe you guys can bring out your toolkits. Yeah. Okay, so, um, okay, nice. <laughs> okay, your kit should consist of a shaper tool, which will look something like that, and a stylus, and copper and silver foil pieces and as well as a pair of scissors and like the most important part like a puzzle that you need to fix okay so um it's up to you if you want to use like the silver or copper piece so whichever you think will suit like the overall aesthetics of your puzzle better so for us, we'll be using the silver one, yeah. Okay, so um, we're gonna just start now. So firstly, just place the foil over your puzzle piece, over the missing piece on the puzzle, like, like that. And then this is followed by using the shaper tool to wrap a rough outline over the missing piece. So this is the tool that you'll be using. And so the shaper tool will be held like a pen during this process. And um, you might require like some strength on your part. So just like um, add on a lot of strength, yeah. And if it feels a bit strenuous to press the fall, you can just uh, check that you're holding the tool like a pen, which will make it easier and it's very helpful. So you should be holding the tool like a pen, which would be very easy to it should be easy to press the file over. Uh, the site for pressing would be uh, like you're talking about a tool, right? Yeah, it should look something like that. Oh yeah, it's the convex side. Yeah. Once I've gotten a rough outline of the missing puzzle piece, continue to use the same tool, which is the shaper tool, to create more details and depth. So this can be done in a sweeping motion inwards towards the center, as you can see Feng Ling is doing it now. So this is uh, actually done to pull more material into the cavity so that the fall does not tear too easily. Uh, I think like for this step, you can like take your time to complete because um, it's not good to rush the process. So you can like carefully go through all the edges and be cautious and we'll just wait for you, yeah. Because if you do it too quickly, you might tear the piece. So just uh, take your time and slowly do it like Feng Ling is. So uh, if at this step you accidentally tear the file, it's all right. You can just uh, take another piece of file because that's why we have uh, more than one. If you have any questions, you can just unmute or type it in the chat.
Uh, the thickness is like 0.127 and mm. Yeah. Uh, if the aluminum foil that you're talking about is like the one that you use to wrap your food, I think uh, it's not recommended because it's quite fragile. So it will tear very easily when you want to do it. So yeah, you can actually get this foil from a uh, art friend if you're interested in doing more. We'll show you the packaging towards the end of the workshop. Um, hi, China. I'm HJ. Yeah, uh, just wondering what other uh, things that we can repair using this method? Do you have any idea or, yeah? <laughs> uh, okay, that's a good question. <laughs> um, not really, because we feel like this repair method is very unique to, to the project that we're doing unless you want to use it to kind of like emboss other objects as like decoration. But for now, we haven't really thought of other methods of repair. But if you have any like ideas, can just share it as well. Yeah. Okay, so uh, once you're satisfied with the embossing that you have just completed, you can proceed to use the next tool, which is the stylus, which is also held like a pen to push outwards around the corner. So, um, this step is done to further refine your, refine the corners and the overall shape. So you can do it the same way that Feng Ling is. Just rub it around the edges of the embossed puzzle piece shape. You can try to get like closer to the edge so that your piece will become more refined and nicer. And you can uh, also be careful with the stylus because uh, it's quite sharp. So it might create some holes in the piece. So just do it slowly as well. And if at any point your foil piece, your foil piece does tear, you can just uh, restart again. Okay, so for those that are finished, you can move on to the next step. For those who are still doing it, you can just uh, take your time. Then we'll uh, repeat the steps again later. So uh, for this next step, you would use the shaper tool to flatten the outer area, which might have curled up during the, in the midst of embossing. So just the peripherals of the embossed puzzle piece and just flatten it very easy. Okay, and once you're done with that, you can just remove the foil from the puzzle and then you can flip it upside down. So uh, when you flip it upside down, you should have like a bumped up version of the puzzle piece on the foil. Uh, then you'll use the stylus, also held like a pen to run around the outline of the piece. 
So this is to make sure that the edges are really crisp and flat. So it'll look nicer once you cut it out later. Okay, so we'll just repeat the same steps again, just in case some of you missed it out. So after you are done with uh, using the stylus to refine the edges, you will use the shaper tool to flatten the peripherals of the four piece. So it's to ensure that because this um, during the midst of embossing in the previous steps, uh, the piece might have curled up. So this is to flatten it. And then once you're done with it, you can remove the file from the puzzle and then you will flip it upside down. And then you use the stylus also held like a pen and then run it around the outline of the piece to give it like a very crisp and flat edge. Okay, so for those that are done with this step, you can now use the scissors to cut the piece out. So when cutting it out, you can eyeball about two to three meter mm spacing. So it should look something like that. So we've actually drawn on the black outline on the puzzle piece. So um, that should be kind of like the gauge that you'll make when you cut out your uh, embossed puzzle piece. If anyone is confused, you can just uh, ask. Yeah, so we kind of need like a two to three mm spacing to ensure that the puzzle rests on the puzzle. The puzzle piece rests on the puzzle uh, in a very stable and flat manner. So you can just cut it out like that. Alternatively, it might be easier for you to cut out like a larger radius and slowly trim it such that it becomes a two to three mm spacing, whichever you think is more comfortable and easy for you to um, cut it out, yeah. Yeah, so now Feng Ling will cut along the black outline, which is a 2 to 3 mm spacing. So um, just be really careful when you're cutting it because um, the edges can be quite sharp and you may cut yourself. So for this step, uh, it's quite normal for your puzzle piece to bend a little when you're cutting it, um, but that's fine. You can just uh, bend it back once you're done cutting.
Uh, so right now, Fong Li is kind of like trimming the edges, but um, if you do it correctly, it should look something like that. If you can see it clearly. Yeah. Okay, so um, like Fong Ling is really done with far trimming, so it looks something like that. I'm gonna pick it up like um, so this is the the back, and then the other way around will look like that as well. Yeah, so you should get something similar to Fong Ling's piece. Uh, you can stick it back onto the puzzle if you want to, like if you want it to be more of like a permanent yeah. fix. But if not, you can just like um, leave it there, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, um, Wei Tin. I think like um, this repair method is sort of kind of to like um, embrace the flaws in the puzzle, which is the missing piece. So it sort of like stands out. So I... I don't think we had the idea of like using like special color paint to fit it with the puzzle piece. But you can if you want to. But I'm not I'm not sure what kind of uh paint can be used. Yeah. Oh, so um if you wanna use a glue to stick to the puzzle, I think maybe something you can try would be super glue. Uh yeah. We haven't actually tried it out, but it should work because um, the material should stick together as well. Maybe you can do like a test piece first before you permanently stick it together in case um, it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, so if everyone is done, uh, it'll be great if you can um, show your faces. Then we'll just take a picture together with like um, our, our puzzle piece. Oh, fixed puzzle piece. I would see. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so thank you everyone for coming to the workshop and waking up so early in the morning. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's early for me. <laughs> I'll hand uh, the time over to Cheryl now to um, end it off. But thank you everyone for coming. Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today for the R for Repair e-workshop Beetle. So this is the third session out of a total of four sessions in this series of workshops. Um, and this is presented as part of the National Design Center's program lineup for January under the theme of sustainability and design. So I'm Felicia from the Design Singapore Council and I'll just be sharing a little bit more about the program for today before we delve into things proper. So this workshop is part of R for Repair, an ongoing exhibition by Hans Tan Studio at the National Design Center, which presents a counterpoint to the modern consumerist culture where repair is either deprecated or ironically deemed extravagant. Through the exhibition and also today's workshop, we hope to shift the concept of repair away from mere restoration and get you to reimagine the role of repair as an inspiring activity that produces aspiring outcomes. So with that, I'll hand the time over to Cynthia and Kakiet, who will be our instructors for today. 
Okay. Hello, I'm Kakia and this is Cynthia. Okay, uh, so today we'll be bringing you through how to use Beedle, a repair kit designed for ribs and tears in bags. Just a quick introduction, we decided on a bag, bag repairs Bag repairs as bags are an everyday necessity. They don't just store our belongings, but also a daily companion. Upon heavy use, um, the best quality of bags will be subjected to wear and tear. With Beedle, we are not only repairing bags, but also giving our bags new personality and life. The process of ironing the beads to the patch the damage is simple and every repair will be very unique. Okay, so Cynthia will be demonstrating the process while I bring you through the steps. You're encouraged to turn on your camera so we can interact with you and keep track of your progress. Okay. okay, then I'll just move on. Um, okay, we'll start now. Uh, just, just to like um, take note, don't worry about getting it perfect because every repair is unique and just like most importantly, remember to have fun. Okay, so I'll start off by introducing the contents of the bag. So our pack contains two packs of beads in two different colorways. Yeah, so this is the first one. This is the second one. <clears throat> so within each like pack of beads, there also comes with two pieces of baking paper. So you can see Cynthia cutting up the pack now. Yeah. Okay, so this is, yep, the baking paper. And, and other than baking paper, lastly, we have the sample swatches of how the finished repair should look like. And just a heads up, every repair will have a unique set of colors. So you can see here, Cynthia has like the more reddish and the more nude colors here. But some of y'all might have the clear colors. Um, so do not worry, we're just trying to switch it up a bit and have everyone, um, yeah, everyone will have different colors. And the colorways we gave are recommended, but please feel free to switch up the color combinations when you are arranging the colors. Uh, you can even mix the colors from two different packs if you wanted to. So things you should have before we start. Um, so do take note, uh, definitely have a pair of scissors with you. Um, ironing board and iron. Yep. I'll give you a few. And then something you should also have will definitely be your bag to repair with the rip. And Cynthia will take out her bag now with a rip. <laughs> Uh, the recommended bag materials are denim, cotton, polyester, and canvas. Um, ideally, also try not to sit under a fan as it might make the ironing process later on a bit more fiddly. And if you're wondering if you can wash your repair later on, it is, it is recommended to go um, to do like gentle washing or hand washing. Yeah, but it is fine to wash it. Okay, so this is the the rip that is in the bag. Okay, um, if everyone has the things they need, I'll proceed on. Uh, another thing to take note, importantly, is that ironing must be done by an adult or supervised child. So if any of you kids are doing it, please remember to um, not do the ironing part by yourself, but ask your parent uh, or an adult around to help. And the beads are strictly not for consumption, even though they look very colorful. Okay, yeah. Um, is everyone okay? Then I will. Okay, that's great. Nice. Okay, so the first step would be to heat up your iron. Um, cotton setting or medium heat is generally recommended. So we are heating up the iron a little bit more early on because it takes a bit more time. So we can, in the meantime, we'll do other stuff. Okay, if we are all done with that, um, we will now be working on the ironing board. So make sure that your ironing board is a flat surface because we'll be placing the beads on it later on. So we don't want any of the beads to fall off. And because they're quite small, it can be quite fiddly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so Cynthia, just now she has cut open her pack of beads, right? So not right now, she's going to use a pair of scissors to cut the baking paper into a smaller piece if she needed to match the, the size of the baking paper to rip in a because uh, but if it's but if you're okay you still don't need to cut it. <laughs> yeah so you place the baking paper below the rip of the bag so that the beads will melt through the hole and taint like the back of your bag. Okay, so um the next step 
we will be working on the beads already. So with a pair of scissors, uh, you can you can look at the, the beads we gave you. You can see what colors you want. And ideally, you should cut the beads out into pairs or individual beads. Yeah, which you can see what Cynthia is doing now. She's like cutting a column and cutting out two beads. Um, cut enough beads that you think will be enough to fill the hole. It might be, the beads are quite small, so don't worry, take your time. Because, yeah, it might be a little hard to handle. So I think over here, Cynthia cut out like six beads, is it? Okay, she's going to cut a little more than six beads. <laughs> don't worry if you want to cut a bit more. And yeah, and please feel free to switch up the colorways if you wanted. If you like some other colors from another pack, please just feel free to um, use those as well. Okay, and then over here, you can see that Cynthia placed the beads over the hole in a standing up position. And remember to place the beads close together, like almost as if they're touching, so your repair will not have any gaps. You can see her packing it together with her fingers. Yep. Um, It is okay if y'all want to cut it in threes as well. We just decided on twos and ones because we wanted a look that was a little bit more less neat and stacked. But if y'all if y'all want like a, a neat two by three row of beads melted together, y'all can go ahead and just cut a two by three bead stack as well. Uh what's the oh so um Stella asked what's the min minimum beads needed to uh to use, I think as long as you have enough, you have beads that are covering the hole and you don't see the hole anymore, I think that's when you know that it should be enough. So just depending on the rip and tear back end, I think generally if you want to be safe, it's always better to use more than to use less. Yeah. So the next step will be to carefully place another piece of baking paper over the completed bead design. And you can do it um, and make sure that none of the beads fall. Yeah. So just place it gently over, just like what Cynthia did here. I think because we will be moving on to the ironing step very soon, ideally, uh, I think the, an adult can take over from this step onwards already if a kid is doing this. Okay. I'll move on to the next step. So uh, we will now proceed on to taking uh, taking our iron and iron over the area, like place it over the beads gently, directly above it, and iron over the area for about one to two minutes. So noting to constantly move the iron and iron till the beads melt and merge together. It is a clear sign it is done when there are no more holes and the color becomes more visible through the baking paper. Can you, hear, you can see that um, Cynthia's one is slowly melting already, as you can see the, but the beads have melted with one another. Yeah, and over here you can choose whether to melt it thinner by ironing it for a longer time, or if you want a more 3D effect, you can iron it for a shorter period of time. But do take note that if you iron it too flat or if you iron it for too long, it may cause the colors to bleed into one another. Yeah, so you can just uh, move it around for a while and definitely because it will be hot, please do not touch it immediately. This part is definitely the most crucial step, so don't worry about it. If you need more time, just let me know. Yeah. Remember to please do not touch the beads because it will be really, really hot. I think one part that me and Cynthia definitely liked most about this part of it was because I, I guess when we used pearler beads as kids, we always had them in very like uh, very fixed forms and they always give you templates. 
where you melt them in very like and then your the your results are always quite pixelated. So I think what Min Sinda found most interesting about this was how the the when the beads melt, they kind of melt haphazardly into one another. And I think it gave like pearl beads this new idea. And I thought it was and, and we thought that it was a very nice application to use it on back repair. Yeah. So we, we hope that you like this look as much as we do. <laughs> um, so we we did do it on bad repair, but you can always use this on um, other other apparels you might have, maybe like a bucket hat. I think generally, as long as the materials are along the lines of denim, cotton, polyester, and canvas, it will be ideal to use beetle because um, the pack we give quite a lot of beads in one pack, so I think you can explore and if you ever have other um applications you apply it on like uh, how can you share it with us? <laughs> you can yeah you can share it with us i think i think by now the the beads will not be very hot anymore so we can slowly peel the parchment paper out and to review the beads oh and please take out the baking paper that we placed inside as well yeah Okay, so you can see that Cynthia has her one and it's really nice. <laughs> um, if you need more time, don't worry. Um, or if you need uh, more demonstration to be done, Cynthia will be working on another one. Yeah. So we have another plain canvas bag and she'll be using a different, the kind of camera. And she'll be using a different colorway. Other, um, Cynthia also tried um, this, the beetle repair kit on her gen spot bag, like even that kind of material, it worked as well. And she washed it a few times as well and it didn't, yeah, and, and it stayed quite well. So she's placing the baking paper below the beads. And this time she cut the beads in, in pairs. It's easier to handle when you cut it in like um in more than one with if you cut at least pairs, yeah, instead of individual beads. Slowly iron it over a piece of baking paper. And noting to constantly move it around so it doesn't burn. You can lift it, lift your iron now and then to see how much the beads have melted. If it melted enough, you can normally see it better through the baking paper. Right now you can see that it has melted quite, quite a bit already and the colors have merged together. Okay. Yeah, and definitely do not touch it. Um, immediately, yeah. You can see that the outcomes for both of them are really quite different. So with every repair, yeah, the result will really be unique. From the way, from the colors you choose and to the way the beads melt with one another. 
wait, I think there's a question from Lydia. Um, how to prevent the beads from dropping off over time? I think one thing that you can prevent it from um, dropping off dropping off over time is that you can iron it more and flat um, iron it flat like quite flat so that the the beads and the wax will melt into the fabric and bind better to the fabric. Yeah. We have another question. Hold on, let me check it out. Um, tried some color beads. Oh, 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 it's not a question. <laughs> On a black and white t-shirt to give it new life. Loving the effect. It's great. We're glad, we are, we're glad you like it. Um, Sarah said, thanks for a fun session. Great to think how to use these familiar materials in a creative new way. Yeah, I think that's the part that me and Cynthia were so most excited about. Um, to see polar beads have this new look to it. Okay, if everyone is done, then I'll round off the session. So thank you so much for spending your early Saturday morning with us. Um, we really hope that you enjoyed the repa repair process as much as we did. And yeah, please feel free to explore where you want to like, um, um, apply these beetle beads at. And just always remember to have fun. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, if you want... I think it's recommended if y'all turn on the cameras now so we can all take a picture with our repairs. Wow, wow Vince, yours very nice. Wow, there's a so lot. Many. <laughs> Wait, um, how do we... How do we go to the thing? Oh, view, 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 gallery. Okay, okay let's take oh, a picture. Oh, it's really nice. We see that a lot of y'all use the um the red one that Cynthia used as well. Yeah. Oh, Lydia applied it to like the top of a handle, which is quite interesting because you've never done that before. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting way of using it. Let's take a picture. Okay. Okay. Sure. Do I do I screenshot? And you. Oh, she did a t-shirt one. Oh, oh that's really nice. Oh, she did it on the nose. She did it on the face of the thing. <laughs> okay. That's really cute. Let's take okay. a screen picture. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, everybody smile. You help hold, okay? Okay. Okay, can't see. Ah. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, nice. Okay. I think okay. another oh, one. Okay, yeah. Wait, how about you hold this? Okay. Okay. <laughs> one, two, three. Nice. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. All your repairs look really, really lovely. Bye. <laughs> Bye. So before we start, uh, can we check if everyone has their kit with them? If you do, please raise your hand. And those that do not, uh, please get your kit ready. Yeah. In the meantime, while today gets ready on her side. A uh, point to note too, our kit consists of a piece with a sharp end. So we strongly recommend adult supervision and guidance if you are doing it, doing your repair with uh, children around. Yeah. So just to be safe. Yeah. All right. So I see that most of y'all have raised your hands. So, okay, moving on. So each kit should consist of a core piece. All right. Uh, we'll start unpacking here. Each kit should consist of a core piece, the center piece that has a sharp edge connected to uh, a, a foam piece and also nine petals of different colors. So you don't really need any other tools for this repair. Yeah. So uh, going through the nine pieces uh, inside the bag, you should have two big circles. You should have two big circles, two small circles two even smaller circles, <laughs> uh, two big semicircles, and one small semicircle. So in total, you should have nine pieces with you. Yeah. Uh, if you all have any missing, please, uh, please feel free to uh, raise your hands. Yeah. So for the core, you may choose to remove the styrofoam protector or not. Yeah. If you have children around, uh, recommend that you leave it on for now. 
Yeah, but if, in the case that you do remove it, please be careful to not, uh, not to hurt yourself with the sharp end of the start. So because the pieces are designed in accordance to the golden ratio, the composition should mostly work out well. So anyone is an artist here, don't worry if uh, you think uh, you, you, you might not know how to compose something nice, but I'm sure you will. <laughs> we designed the parts in a way to have a tight fit. So you may hang uh, each full bloom on the wall without having any fallen petals. So, so thus, we will start with planning our compositions out before piecing them into the core. Yep. So uh, looking at the core now, there are four holes each at the north, south, east and west of the core, uh, making up a total of 16 holes. So uh, to plan your compositions, you should have that in mind. Uh, and yeah, to start off, let's plan it on a flat surface like your table to save the hassle of taking out the pieces uh, after you put it into the, to the centerpiece. So set the pieces as you would around an imaginary center core in the four directions. So now you'll be uh, forming your compositions according to any way you like. So you do not need to use all the pieces. Just use the ones uh, you play colors that match each other or don't match is up to you. Uh, and make sure the joints are at 90 degrees to each other. So just imagine that the center piece is right smack in the center. Yeah. So uh, now let's take some time to play around with the arrangements and combinations to find out what you like. And once you're done and happy with your composition, please raise your hands and we will move on to the next step. Uh, we encourage you all to turn your cameras on so uh, we can like look at each other and uh, share our pieces later on too. Yep. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, free to ask. All right, to repeat, uh, once you're done, please Raise your hands so that we know that uh, you're finished. Uh, I see that we have a new participant coming in, Charmaine. So to catch you up, uh, our kit consists of uh, nine pieces and a centerpiece. So now we're in the process of uh, arranging the compositions around the center. Yeah, so feel free to just play around with whatever uh, arrangements you want uh, until it's satisfactory. All right, 
Uh, I'll take it that most of y'all are done. Give me a second. All right, so let's move on to the next step. So the next step is uh, once we are done, uh, we, we are gonna plan the layout. Uh, after, sorry, after planning the layout, we're gonna start building. Yep. So the kit is designed in a way to allow you to remove and insert another piece if you were to change your mind or simply want to change the abstract of your wall plug. But an important thing to the note, because the fits are so tight, uh, you should refrain from drastically twisting the piece out in the case that you want to change the piece as it may break the connector joint. So instead, hold the petal as close as possible to the core like this, right? And uh, slowly pull it out in the opposite direction of the core, very slowly and gently. So when you do this, you might want to uh, wiggle it out very slightly, just so very slightly, uh, but don't twist too much, yeah. So uh, moving on, the tip is to start building from the front row to the back. So we won't have a hard time trying to slot a petal between two uh, others later on. Uh. So to put in the core pieces, simply push the connector joint through the hole. This might take a bit of effort as the holes are tight fit and designed to hold your compositions on the wall for a very long time. So yeah, slowly uh, push your petal in, but make sure not to twist it. Yep. Uh, so uh, let's do this right now. Uh, form your compositions on the centerpiece and take your time to push it in uh, and be careful not to break the pieces. Then feel free to unmute or chat with us drop, or drop a message if you have any questions. Yeah. And lastly, raise your hand when you're done so we can move on uh, to the next step. Yeah. So with each kit, you can create many different styles and compositions. So once if, if you put your, your, your pieces in and you realize that maybe it's not the composition you want, uh, you can always take them out and then try it again with another different piece uh, or another different composition. Also, if you put it on a wall and like maybe after six months or so, you're bored of it, you can always just switch up the pieces whenever you want. Uh, Cece, as you can see, she's playing around with different compositions uh, that she thinks is nice. <laughs> so feel free to like maybe even reference uh, how she's doing it or if you like any of her compositions, really just you could just copy her or just make your own. We encourage you to make your own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, let's have fun.
Uh, Lydia has a question. So, hi, where do you get your materials from? So, for the acrylic pieces, uh, they, they, we just got them from normal a normal acrylic piece shop and then uh, laser cutted them to size, uh, custom made. And then as for the middle piece, uh, it was 3D printed, made with resin. Yeah, so that's basically it. So a little behind the motivations of why we came out with this project is because uh, we wanted everyone to be able to play a part or having have a part of their character built uh, to, to build into their house or to create a piece that can be part of their home so that uh, to add part of their own personality inside their home yeah. instead of having a... Oh. Uh, we will wait for everyone to finish before we move on to the next step. Ah. Yeah, so please wait patiently. <laughs> yes, don't worry. Are you done? Hello. Hello, how are you? Have you eaten breakfast? Cairo? <laughs> you made the same one. Oh yeah, in the set of nine acrylic pieces, there's actually one that is dichroic colored. So when you look at it from different angles, it has different colors. Yeah, so that's quite interesting by itself. But one tip here is uh, you may want to put it away from a solid color backing so that you can see it clearer. Yeah, you see like if you put it in front of a solid color, it disappears. So maybe put it in a gap uh, between two pieces and there and it will stand up more. Yep. Just a tip. Once you're done, please raise your hands, but please take your time. All right. Uh, so point to note, uh, if you haven't identified the hole in your home, it should look something like this. So the hole in, your, the, hole in the wall of your home uh, will need a plastic wall plug inside. So normally when uh, you drill the wall, there's already a piece inside or when you remove the piece that was there before so just leave it in uh, as it will serve as a support for your repair piece yeah okay so i reckon everyone is done so this is also another another example of how you can do it uh, this is a more monochrome set with a little orange right there so all right i think uh once you're done let's get everyone to show the camera your beautiful pieces yeah so you can like see what each each other has done and also look at your wonderful arrangements yeah so it will be great if you can put it up into the camera to the camera all right if you could please turn on your camera i see everyone likes a lot of people like pink color Tete, come over all right let me just wait for Tete to come over then we can take a group picture uh, like that, right? Oh, oh yeah. Okay.
Okay. Oh no. I'm it. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, shoulder. Hmm? All right. So let's take a picture in three, two, one. Okay. All right. So everyone ready? Yeah, not in the picture. Oh, no, I. Okay. Three, two, one. <laughs> let's go. Uh, it's three. Yeah. <laughs> Another one. Sorry. Three, two, one. Okay, nice. Oh, y'all have all very wonderful pieces. Congratulations. <laughs> all right. So uh, actually, you are almost done. So now the only step left is to just place it in your wall. <laughs> yeah, just place it in your wall. Uh, if the wall, if the hole in the wall is too, too small, uh, you can try to widen it a little more first before putting the piece in. Yeah. Uh, and voila, your con congratulations, you have completed your repair uh, with a flower that's fully bloomed on your wall. So <laughs> thank you. We've come to the end. So thank you everyone for coming to our e-workshop this morning. And we really, really hope you guys had an enjoyable time with us here today. So now we'll pass the time back to Felicia. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Tizi and John Joe, for hosting our last workshop in this series of R for Repair e workshop. So, before you guys go, I really appreciate it if you complete a simple survey to help us improve on our future programs. So, you can do so by simply scanning the QR code that you see on the left. And if you'd like to find out more about other programs that the National Design Center has lined up, you can scan the QR code that you see on the right. And so with that, we will end the session for today. Thank you once again to everyone and our instructors for spending your morning with us. And also, if you've not already done so, the R for Repair exhibition will be ongoing all the way to 6th of February. So do drop by to check it out. Thank you.